So today we're wrapping up the story of Joseph, the, the series that we've been, we've been walking through the life of a man named Joseph, and, um, and it's, been, it's been an interesting story. Would you agree? Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever looked at it in this light, what we've been presenting it, learning about it as, but, but it's been a, just a very applicable story for our lives. And I can't tell you, I, there have been a few people this week that, that have come to me and shared stories with me, and it's been amazing to see how certain things have just kind of lined up. And like, almost as if God knew that this week was going, or this, this series was going to happen, and he coordinated that with certain things that were going to go on in your life. And I think that's amazing. I think that there are certain things that, that we've, just, we've just seen God at work throughout the last six weeks, and I'm so excited for that. And I hope that today we can just kind of wrap the series up, put a nice little bow on it, and walk away and go, God, you're good. You know, because I think that that's just something that we need to, we need to, we need to trust him. And, and that's really what I want to talk about today. You see, we've, we've, we've dealt with some encouraging things. We've, we've unearthed some things that we need to look into further. From Joseph, we've learned about temptation. We've learned about God's goodness. We've learned about forgiveness, even when it's hard. And today, we're gonna, we need to tackle one last thing. And so I, I want to give you just a, I want to summarize this entire story. It's probably going to take a few minutes. But I want to summarize this entire story so that those of you that haven't been here throughout all the six weeks or maybe our guests with us today, you understand what we've been talking about. And then we're going to kind of just bring it to a head and um, hopefully... Uh, just, just realize that God is so good. So we started with a young man. He was 17 years old, a man who had all of his dad's favor. He had, he had 11 brothers. One of them was younger, the rest of them were older brothers. He was in a position, he was a real middle child, right? Not so much, though, because he, he, was, he was favored by his father, Jacob. Jacob loved his son. He loved his mother. He had, he had, Jacob had kids with, with four women, and he loved Rachel the most, and Rachel bore him two sons. It was Joseph and, and Benjamin. And he loved Benjamin. He made him a coat of many colors. He made him, he made him handmade clothing. He, he showed him favor. He, he gave him the best of everything. He gave him his love. He did, he did what he could for them at the, at the neglect of his other siblings. And so he was the second, of, of, uh, second youngest of 12 brothers total. And when dad shows favor to one of 12 sons, you can imagine that that doesn't go over well with a group of guys, Right? They're competing. They want to be the best. Their egos get in the way, right? Isn't that how guys are sometimes? Especially brothers? Yeah. There's bitterness. There's anger. There's resentment all over this preferred brother. And combine that with a bit of a naive spirit in Joseph and, and some bad attitudes in the other brothers, and you end up with a recipe for hatred. And that's what the Bible says, is that the ten older brothers hated Joseph. On more than one account, the Bible says that they hated him. It wasn't a statement, I hate you, in a fit of rage, like a, a brother would say to another brother in the middle of a fight. It was an attitude. It was a held-on thing. This was ongoing, and it was persistent, and they despised their brother. He got so many things that they did in a coat of many colors, dreams that he'd rule over them one day, and it drove them apart from one another. And so one day when Joseph's approaching them off in the distance, about 60 miles from home, the brothers see his bright, colorful coat, and they decide that they want to kill him. They've had it. They, they don't want to see this brother anymore, and they, they, they are done with this. But instead of murdering him in cold blood, it would be easier to cover their tracks if he fell into a pit, right? So they stripped off his coat, they pushed him over the ledge, and lo and behold, he lives. And Joseph is screaming, ha ha, really funny, guys, that was great, uh, it didn't hurt, you know, all those things that you try to tell your brothers, like trying to be tough, and, and you don't want them to know, you're feeling weak in the moment, and even if he had a broken leg, he's, it's his older brother, he's got to be tough, so he's probably like, that didn't hurt, that all you got? Come on, give me another chance, and you know, trying to figure out a way to get out of that pit. He was screaming, he was crying, as time went on, it got more and more desperate, and he would scream, and they could hear him out of this pit, and all their brothers could do was just eat lunch. No remorse, no compassion, no guilt. They hated their brother. But they did end up getting him out of the pit, but only because they saw a caravan coming in the distance, one that would, that would buy him, and then end up reselling him in Egypt at a profit. And so Joseph was carried off to Egypt, away from everything that he knew, from his family, from his home, from his father, from his favor of his father, his language, even. His life changed in a matter of hours. And so Joseph lands in Egypt. He's a slave for, for Potiphar, who happens to work for the government at that time. And because the Lord was with Joseph, Potiphar showed him favor, recognizing that the Lord was at work in this young man's life. And that was until Potiphar was told by his wife that Joseph made advances at her while wa in wanting to sleep with her. 
We know this isn't true. If you read the account, you see that Joseph day after day after day refuses the advances of Potiphar's wife. He couldn't help it that he was good looking, right? But that's what's true. Joseph refused the temptation day in and day out, day in and day out every day. He would say no. And the day that she grabbed his cloak, he took off running out of the house just to get away from it. He just said no to temptation, but he left his coat behind. And she took that coat. She told her husband. He was taking his clothes off. He was making an advance at me. He thought he could seduce me. And Potiphar burned with anger. And so he threw him in jail. For doing the right thing, Joseph was thrown into jail. And even though he's in jail, though, we find that the Lord was with Joseph. We find that, that God was with Joseph, and the warden gave him responsibility, and he trusted him. And when two of Pharaoh's servants were thrown in jail, Joseph looks after them and interprets dreams for them. One of them ends up getting executed, but the other ends up leaving jail and going back to work for, for Pharaoh. But before he leaves, Joseph pleads with him, asks him, says, will you please do me a favor? He said, will you mention me to Pharaoh? Will you remember me when you go back to work for Pharaoh and put in a good word so that maybe I can just leave this place? I'm not a bad guy. I did, I did all the right things and I'm here. Unfortunately, the friend forgets about Joseph for a long, long time until Pharaoh has a dream and is looking for someone to interpret it. Pharaoh's servant then tells, tells him about Joseph and Joseph is summoned to Pharaoh's presence. And Joseph interprets a dream as seven years of great harvest are coming. The land will be plentiful. It will produce so much food. But then after that time, there's going to be famine throughout all the land. And it's going to be severe. And if we don't prepare, there's going to be many, many casualties and many, many deaths. And so Pharaoh promotes Joseph for almost a decade. Or promotes Joseph, and for almost a decade, Joseph works as a government official, overseeing the affairs of, of Egypt. He marries an Egyptian wife. He has a couple of kids. Life is great. But last week, we talked about Joseph's buried hurts. He tried to forget. He tried to forget his family. He tried to forget the things and the pain that he, in the past that he had to deal with. And his, his brothers show up on the scene because they're affected by this famine. They're looking for food, and they don't recognize Joseph all decked out in his fancy clothes and his Egyptian makeup. Joseph doesn't know how to respond and accuses them of being spies. He throws them in jail for a few days and decides that he wants to see his younger brother, Benjamin. So he summons them, and in the process of sending them back, he hears... In his native language, somewhat of a confession and a little remorse for what had happened so many years ago. And this unlocks the hardened heart and the walls that he's built up to numb the pain. And it all comes crumbling down. And now he's got a decision to make. Now he's got a decision to make. He can punish them. He can serve them and send them back home. Or he can forgive and he can reconcile with his brothers. So if you have Bibles with me, I want to pick up today. This is where we're at in the story. In Genesis chapter 45, verses 4 through 8, we're going to read those to get off here. But what we find, giving you a little context, what we find here is that Joseph is talking with his brothers. We know he's upset. He's weeping. And he's, he's dealing with, with all of the emotion coming running back. Imagine if you were separated from family and hurt you for, for almost 20 years. And all of a sudden they show up on the scene wanting to talk with you, wanting something from you. The reason that you went through all the pain in your life the reason that you took the path that you took is because of them, right? And they show up and they're asking you for a favor. This is what Joseph is dealing with. This is what we, we talked about last week. And so we're going to see how Joseph decides to deal with this. So, Genesis 45, verse 4. I'm reading out of the ESV. It says, So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve a life. For the famine has been in the land for these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now I want you to pay attention to Joseph's perspective here because it's key to his actions. His perspective determines his actions. And so he says, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve a life. The wording is super important there. God sent me before you to preserve not life, 
a life. Isn't that interesting? Whose life? This is the line, this is the nation of Israel. This is the nation through its lineage that would, that would come from, from that would Jesus would come from, that Jesus would be born from. This is the line of David. This is the line that would, you, would, you would follow throughout all the Old Testament. God had a plan. You see, God had a plan in the beginning. All the way back when Joseph was walking the earth, he said, I sent, you, I sent him to preserve the nation, to save a life, to preserve a life. But more than that, I want to look more at Joseph today. He says, don't be distressed or angry with me yourself because God sent me before you. I want to illustrate this with a story. A shoe manufacturer who decided to open the Congo market sent two salesmen to the undeveloped territory. One salesman came back, and he, he, he responded. He said, prospect here, nil. No one wears shoes. But the other salesman reported enthusiastically. He said, market potential is terrific. Everyone is barefooted. <laughs> right? It's all in your perspective. I work part-time on Mondays for a sign guy, all right? And I cannot drive down the road without looking at a sign and going, they need some work, you know? <laughs> and so I think about cold calling them, like, that's not my place. I'm not going to do that. We don't need more work right now, right? You're busy. Um, but, uh, but that's the thing is, like, your perspective determines that. I have a sign. I don't need a sign, right? Or that sign's terrible, <laughs> We need to get it moving, right? It, it's all in your perspective. Remember a couple of weeks ago we were talking about smelly things and, and awesome things? I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So those of you that are like, I don't know what you're talking about, I'll explain that in a second. But sometimes our perspective is looking down instead of looking up, isn't it? Sometimes our perspective is just so messed up. Joseph could have easily been negative in this situation. I want you to hear me about this because you've got to look at this. We're, ending, we're getting near to the end of the story and it's very easy to be like, like at the end of a movie, oh, this is so sweet and this is so great and we can get the warm and fuzzies on the inside and we can be so happy that everything is great and well in the world again, right? Because that's what happens. But what we have to identify with is who Joseph, what Joseph is doing in this process. Because what today's message is is really an extension of last week's message because forgiveness, forgiveness is not a super important thing. But in order for forgiveness to take place, what do you got to do? You've got to trust in the God who gave you forgiveness first. You've got to have trust that he will take care of the vengeance. The Lord says the vengeance is mine. In Romans, he talks about that. The vengeance is mine. That God will be the judge. He'll be the ultimate judge of all people. He's told us that forgive as I have forgiven you. When he was teaching, some people asked Jesus, they said, how many times should we forgive? Once, twice, three times, four times? I mean, surely you can't do more than that because they just keep making the same mistake, right? I mean, that's our mentality today. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? That's the mentality that we operate by today. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Forgive them how many times? Ugh, right? That's like almost every day for a year, at least, right? My math is terrible. I'm totally just playing with you. Yeah, I know, 490, so it's over a year. But I know seven times seven. I just got to add the zero on there, right? I really need to stop helping my daughter with, with math. <laughs> but um, the thing is, is that you have to look at Joseph. And you have to look at his mind. You have to look at who he is. You have to look at the fact that he's still human. He is somewhat mythical to us because we can't be introduced to him. We don't have a picture of him. It's, it's words on a page. And how many stories have we read about people that don't exist that are words on a page, right? Okay, but Joseph existed. He lived. He was a real person. He was complex, like many of us are complex, right? That's not meant to be an insult. That's just meant to be like the way it is, right? We all have different attitudes. We have different moods. We have different things we care about. We have different ways that we react to things, right? And so Joseph is a person. He is a real guy. And it would have been very easy for him to be vengeful and to look at everything that happened to him and be bitter and want to pay back everything that they caused to happen by their act. But he wasn't. He looked at his circumstances. He looked at his God. And in the end, he said this was him and it was for a purpose 
It was for a purpose. Now that's perspective, isn't it? That's perspective. That's not staring down, looking at his dirty, stinky circumstances. If I took my boot off right now and I held it up to you, Let me put it this way. When I take my boots off at night, I go, wow. And I can't stop looking at them. Just reiterating what we said a couple weeks ago. That's bad. And you get some of that powder, maybe some aerosol spray, for breeze. I don't know what you use, but you got to get it in there and get rid of that smell, right? Because sometimes, this is more true for guys, I think, than ladies. But sometimes when something really stinks, it just soaks up our attention, doesn't it? It does. For me, I know it does. I mean, Jeff Foxworthy had that joke. I'd say it again. Jeff Foxworthy had that joke. He's like, I don't remember what, it, what he was holding up, but he was like, he was, made a joke about the fact that you smell something and you, you guys share it with people. They're like, dude, you got to get a whiff of this, right? You walk over and you check it out. We sometimes get absorbed in the stinky circumstances of life. We get absorbed looking down and going, man, that is so bad. That is so, so bad. And we start walking around life like this. And I can't see Keith sitting right here. I can't, I mean, I can see his feet. They probably stink too. I don't know. But but the fact of the matter is, is when I'm looking down, I can't see what's going on up around me. I can't lift my, I can't lift my eyes to the heavens and worship the Lord. I can't, I can't serve one another because what am I doing? I'm so self-absorbed. I'm so looking at myself. I look at my circumstances and they stink and that's all I see. Joseph could have easily done that. He could have easily been focused on that. But it doesn't compare to what, what, and and it shouldn't take away from what God was doing all around him. God was doing something amazing through Joseph and through the work that was was happening in the world. Um, A man read an ad in a newspaper, uh, said hunting dog for sale, $2,500, but well worth it. So he's curious. He called the number. And the man told him that he had to see the dog in action. So the next morning, they met and went hunting early. The dog, the dog flushed two birds from a clump of bushes, and when they fell into the water, he walked on top of the water, grabbed the birds, and walked back on top of the water. And the man was amazed. The dog was walking on water, and he bought the dog on the spot. The next day, he persuaded his brother to go hunting with him. They flushed a couple of birds out, and, and the dog again walked on top of the water, retrieved the birds, and walked back to their boat on top of the water. He asked his brother what he thought of the dog, and the brother who cried replied, so you bought a dog that can't swim. <laughs> Perspective, right? Oh my gosh, something amazing is happening in front of your eyes, and that's all you can see is the negative. He can't get in the water. Great, he's not going to get back in the boat and shake it all off and get you wet, right? That's kind of the idea. Here's the perspective. Listen, we both know that whatever it is that you're going through, you're going to get through this. We both know that. You're going to get through this. Whether you come out on the other side all spick and span and shiny and ready to face another day, or you come out a little worse for wear. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but we both know you're going to get through this. And whatever your this is, fill in the blank with whatever is going on in your life. Whatever your this is, you've got to make sure that you're looking out for something good. You've got to keep your head up. You've got to look out for something good because God is going to use whatever mess you're in for something so good. He's going to use it for something so good. But you might say, well, I caused the mess. How can you use that for something good, right? Like, that's, that's not fair. Yeah, you might have caused the mess. But not only is the mess going to transform you and keep you from repeating the sin that caused the mess, but God sure can use you and your story of His faithfulness to help other people in their mess too. Amen? How many of you have ever struggled with debt? How many of you have ever struggled? You don't have to raise your hands. I'm just rhetorical questions. How many of you have ever struggled with uh, dieting and weight loss? Right? How many of you have ever struggled with, with dealing with kids? Right? <laughs> Careful. We might start a war in here. We mess up in those areas, don't we? We mess up in those areas sometimes, don't we? And you know what? Sometimes it creates problems, but God can use that mess for something good. God is going to use your mess 
for something so good. But don't get down on yourself. Don't be foolish. Don't be naive. Don't despair. You have to keep perspective. You have to see the big picture, just like Joseph did. Joseph, Joseph surely heard about this covenant that God made with his forefather, Abraham. If you, if you flip back, I'm not going to ask you to flip back because we're going to come back to where we were. But in Genesis 15, 5, it says this, And the Lord brought Abram outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. God made a covenant with Abraham and has been carried down through the lines. There's only a couple generations beyond Abram. Uh, his name was Abram at the time, but it changed to Abraham. So you can use those kind of interchangeably sometimes if you want to. Um, but, uh, but he made this covenant with Abraham. And he's like, he said, here you go. This is your offspring. This is what it's going to look like. I'm going to bless you with this. And then in Genesis, a little later in, the, in, the, in that chapter, 13 through 16, he said, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. Listen, he's telling Abraham this. Or Abram. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation they serve. And afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go out to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God is telling him that his, his offspring, those that will come from him eventually, are going to experience suffering. They're going to experience affliction. They will become servants in a land. Sounds like a couple of different situations, right? And throughout the life of you know much about the Old Testament? Kind of sounds like the fact that, you know, Joseph brought his family to Egypt, right? A couple of, like, you go flip over to Exodus. What's happening? Who's, who, what does Moses have to do? He has to rescue the Israelites from Egypt because they've become slaves, because they've been oppressed, and God is going to take them to the promised land after that. You see, God told Abram that there was going to be some struggle. There are going to be they were going to be in lands that weren't their own. And they're going to be servants and they'll be mistreated. And Joseph, knowing this history in his family about this God, realized at some point God knew this was going to happen. He knew that these things were going to take place. And I want you to have this perspective because God knew that you were going to go through this at, right at this time. And he knew that Max Licato was going to write this book and that I was going to use it for these six weeks to help us learn some of these concepts that we've been going over. He was going to use these teachings and he was going to use it to bless your lives. God knew that these things were going to happen and he used it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And all things, all things work together to glorify God, to make him known and to accomplish his purposes. Amen. All things work together. So that means all things that are happening in your life that God is willing to happen, He can reweave them. He can take maybe even what you intended for evil and reweave it into something that is intended for good. He can reweave what is done to you that was evil and He can just carefully undo those threads and put them back together so that something, it just looks amazing. It's so glorifying to God. It's so pleasing to God. And so I really don't know what your this is today, but I do know that you're here for a purpose and that you're here because God wants you to respond to Him and to His gospel. He knows that whatever this is, it's hard. He knows that what you're going through is tough. He knows that it stinks. And, he really, and you really just wish it would disappear and be done with. But sometimes it's going to hurt. And you want to look up to the heavens and you want to ask God, why did you give me this issue to deal with? Why am I the one you chose to carry this burden? You ever asked that question before? And I'm not sure he'll answer you. I'm not sure he's just going to drop, you know, a little answer card right in front of you and say, this is why I did that. You know, I, I'm sure many of you have tried that. Like, I'm going to flip the Bible open to a certain page, put my finger down, and that's what's going to be, you know, the answer to you. It's a, sometimes it's really bad. I mean, I, I'm sure God can use that, but not a tactic I would suggest. I'm not sure he's going to answer you, but he will remind you that you are just one piece of a large puzzle. 
You are just one piece of a large puzzle. And being that one piece, it's hard to see what's going on. You don't have a high-level view of your life. You can't see the box, <laughs> right? You don't know if it's, if it's, a, it's, a, if it's a, like a nice little picture of a kitty cat, let's say, resting on a, you know, in its little bed or something in front of a window, and there's flowers all around. I'm painting a picture for you. So just imagine this puzzle picture thing. If you're one piece of that puzzle, you don't know if you're a whisker. You don't know if you're the nose. You don't know if you're an ear. You don't know if you're the window. You can't. You are, you are at the work of the Master. And He is gently taking those puzzle pieces and He's putting them together so that the majesty of His big picture can be displayed for all the world to see in all of His glory and all of His awesomeness. So you don't have a high level view of your life. And that's what makes the faith in the Lord beautiful is trust. Trust that He knows what He is doing. Trust that He is so, so good. Trust that He is looking out for you. Trust that no matter what you're going through, He will see you through it. All things happen just as He decided that they would happen long ago. Psalm twenty two twenty eight says, For kingship belongs to the Lord and He rules over the nations. In Hebrews 1, 3, this is, this is awesome. I love this verse. It says, He, or Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. You know, we sing that song that God's got the whole world in His hands, right? God doesn't even need His hands. All He's got to do is speak. And the universe just organizes itself and goes into it. Isn't that amazing? That's the God that you serve. That's the God that when you shake your fist and you go, God, what are you doing? What are you doing with my life? Because this stinks. This is, this is terrible. All the circumstances in my life, I just don't understand what's happening right now. And when you shake that fist at him, he's the one that's gone. It's okay. I get it. It stinks right now. And, and, and he's, he's so awesome and he's so good. He can look down in your life and he can, he can bring himself to your level because that's what Jesus did. He experienced all of the temptations you could ever face. He went through them. He went through them. And God can go, I get it. I know it hurts. I know there's pain. I never said it was going to be easy. I never said it was going to be quick. But I am going to use you for good. I'm going to use you for something so good. Just trust me. Just trust me. I need a volunteer. I love that reaction. That just makes me happy. I need a volunteer. Come on up, Miss Nikki. I'm going to blindfold you. I just blew my nose in this this morning. Just so you know, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'll let you put that on, or can you tie that and put it on? Just so you can't see, all right? Move this out of the way, just so you don't kill yourself. <clears throat> How's your balance? <laughs> you turn that on or off? <laughs> <laughs> all right so here's what's going to happen i'm going to spin you around i'm going to walk you around so you're kind of a little bit disoriented all right and uh yeah okay good we're good she can't see anything i can tell can you see can you see anything i can see a little bit of light you can see a little bit of light like can you see my shadow or anything like if i move okay good perfect this is very good you might die. Just so you know, I'm kidding. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to disorient you a little bit, all right? So I'm going to spin you around, and I'm going to walk you around, okay? And what we're going to do is this is, this is just kind of life, all right? We're going to spin around. Are you dizzy yet? Yeah? All right, and then we're going to walk you this way. I'm going to walk you over here. Got to watch the cables. Yep. Yep. I'm watching the cables for her so she doesn't totally die here. All right. So I'm just going to leave you right there because I feel like I've disoriented you enough. Um, that's life, right? We get disoriented in life. We get spun all around. We get shaken up, and we kind of end up in a place. Now, uh, Nikki, I want you to go back to your seat. All right, you can, you can stop. You can stop. That's, that's kind of what it's like in life, right? It's like we're stumbling, we're stumbling around. We're trying to, trying to find things. Have you felt like that in life? Like, like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. Like, what's the plan here, God, Right? 
I don't, I don't get what's happening. And there are obstacles all around you, right? There's temptations. There's things to stub your toe on. There's things that she could probably just smack her eye right on that microphone there if she wanted to. I was really going to try to just really mess with her, but I'm not, I'm gonna, we're going to stay on Jesus right now. Um, <laughs> so, so what needs to happen? You need to take the blindfold off, yes. But how do you, no, no, you can't take the blindfold off. That's not the right answer. She needs guidance. Because have you ever had God come down and walk you through life by the hand? I mean physically, actively, like, here you go. I'm going to show you the path. No, you got to figure it out, don't you? There's a little bit of work involved, isn't there? There's a little bit of prayer. There's a little bit of petition. There's a little bit of listening, isn't there? A little bit of rest in life that you've just got to sit back and you got to go, God, where, where am I supposed to do here? And then you got to start walking and you got to trust when God gives you an answer, right? You've got to trust him in order to get through life. So Nikki, I want you to, um, where you are, I got to get oriented, make sure I don't give you a wrong direction because that could really hurt. So <clears throat> um, I would like for you to turn around 180 and uh, walk the other way. Now, step to your left a little bit. Left. <laughs> if you want to do it backwards, we can do it backwards. Now, I'm going to ask you to walk forward. Okay, keep going. Walk forward, walk forward, walk forward, walk forward. Now, turn to your right. Yep, there you go. Walk forward, walk forward. Listen to my voice. Walk forward. Now, turn to your right again. There you go. Good. Now, walk forward. Walk forward, walk forward. Turn a little bit more to the right. You're going to pet uh, Michaela there. Okay, keep going. Walk forward, walk forward. Now, I need you to sidestep to your left. There you go. W- one more little step. There you go. Now walk forward, walk forward, walk forward. Keep going. Walk forward. Now, you're going to come over some obstacles now. Um, You've got to pick up your feet, okay? So pick up your feet and keep walking forward. Maybe step to your right just a, t- a tad. There you go. There you go. Oh, you got some obstacles. Be careful. Walk carefully. All right, keep going. Now, turn a little more to your left. Okay, now walk forward. Walk forward. Walk forward. Walk forward. Keep listening. Okay, now stop. Turn left. Carefully walk forward. You're walking to a narrow spot. There you go. Now, turn. There we go. She found her way. You can't take the blindfold off yet. No, I'm kidding. Listen. We're blindfolded. We can't see our Lord. We can't see things where he wants us to go in this life. Sometimes you're looking at, maybe you come to a crossroads and you're like, I don't know if I should, um, if I should take this job or if I should keep this job. I don't know if I should marry this person or, or leave, excuse me, leave this person. I don't know how I should handle my kid. I don't know if I should go into debt to buy this house or if I, if I should look for something else and wait on the Lord. I don't know what, what things are the right things to do. And, and we have all of these things around us. And, 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 and you know as well as I do that sometimes one decision can send us down a path that is very painful, can it? One wrong decision can send you down a path that is very painful, and one, one decision can maybe spare you some of that, that issue and can bring maybe a little bit of favor in your life. This is why it's important to understand and know who God is. This is why it is important to understand and know what the Word says about your Lord and your Savior. This is why it is important to understand what grace and forgiveness is. But more importantly, it's so that you can trust Him when you hear His voice speak. Now, I'm not claiming to be a prophet. I'm not claiming anything. But when I talk on Sunday morning, I pray every morning that, that my words would be his words. You hear me pray that often. Now, I get things wrong. All right? A couple of weeks ago, I had to admit to you the fact that I said that Joseph was the, younger, was the youngest brother. He wasn't. It was Benjamin. Totally forgot about Benjamin for some reason. But I had to admit that to you. I make mistakes. But you also, many of you go to groups throughout the week. And you experience teaching. You experience advice from them. You may listen to sermons on TV and online. You may listen to teaching from other people that maybe you respect. And if you do not 
heed those words, if you do not listen to what God is trying to tell you, if you do not develop a spirit of discernment to understand where God may be leading you, and if you don't trust Him to begin walking in that direction, you're going to stay right here with all the obstacles around you. And you're never going to find it to your seat. You have to learn how to trust the Lord. You have to learn that He is so good, that He is so awesome, that He doesn't want anything bad to happen to you. But we live in a broken world. We live in a world where we choose to put ourselves on the throne and, and in effect dethrone God from His. He gives us that choice. That's what love is all about. But the gospel is, is that while you were still a sinner, while you were still choosing to be king and, and, and ruler of your own life, God sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die for your sins. He sent Jesus to this earth to experience all the temptation, to teach us, to do miracles for us, to show us the way, to show us how to live, to fulfill the law. But then God took him to a cross where evil was done to him, where bad things, death was brought upon him. His blood was shed, his body was broken. And he died a physical death. It was put in a tomb for three days. And on that third day, we all know that story. The stone was rolled away and no body could be found. Jesus physically resurrected from the dead. He defeated sin. And anyone who should come to him, who should trust him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the best news that the world has ever seen. Corey Ten Boom said this once, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. You may be blindfolded, you may be experiencing pain, and you may not know what your future looks like, but God is known in your life. And if God is known in your life, then all your pain, all your struggle, all your questions... They're for purpose. They are for a purpose. So I know that you struggle with these things. I know that you struggle with pain. But I also know that God created you so that He could love you and that you could reveal Him in some way on this earth to someone who doesn't know Him yet. It doesn't make this, whatever your this is, it doesn't make this go away. It doesn't even make it okay. But it does give this purpose in the bigger picture. Trust Him because He loves you. Trust Him. I just want to hand some of these out today. These are cards with our, uh, our saying that we've been saying today. If I, could I get a couple people to help me out? I have more of these if you feel like a friend could use these, but I want to make sure everyone gets one today. On this card, it has a saying, and when you, when you get this card, we're all going to read it together. That's how I just want to end this. Because this saying, I've heard it said more often this last six weeks than I think I've heard anything we've ever talked about. The, you'll get through this. It won't be painless, it won't be quick, but God is going to use this mess for something good. And I've heard you guys reference that. I heard it in our leadership meeting the other night when we were going through policy. We looked at it and we just went, oh, we don't want to talk about this. This is not fun to talk about. And somebody said, we'll get through this. Somebody else said, it won't be easy. And the other person said, it won't be quick. Right. But God is going to use this for something good. And so from the small things in life to the gigantic things in life, from the, from the little things that hurt you to the big things that rock your world, I want you to know today that you're going to get through this. You will get through this because God is going to use you for something good. And so I'm asking you to trust Him. Trust Him for the forgiveness that He's offered to you in order that you can extend it to the people in your life that have wronged you, that owe you, and you can extend it beyond that. Let's read this together. You'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. In the meantime, don't be foolish or naive. 
But don't despair either. With God's help, you will get through this. Stick this in your wallet. Stick it on your mirror. If you want one to give your friend, I got probably about 100 of them left. But keep it with you. And when something happens, when something that is perceived evil happens to you, remember, you will get through this.